This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Healthy Happens Here webinar series. We're going to go ahead and get started for today. This is a series of virtual webinars that cover a variety of health topics, including nutrition, mental health, tobacco cessation, and chronic disease self-management. My name is Candice Schottenmore, and I'm a health educator here with the Florida Department of Health in Miami-Dade County with the community engagement team. And just a few housekeeping items before we get started. We um, will begin. Please know that you have the capability to have your camera on or off and the ability to mute and unmute yourself later on for the Q&A session. But as a reminder, if you're not speaking, please remember to keep your microphone on mute. And also, again, we'll have our Q&A later on in the webinar. So please remember that you can add in any questions in the chat box today, and we will have those monitored and shared throughout the series. And in addition, um, with our presenter, we will follow up with these questions. And so today's event is called Asthma and Allergy Awareness Month. We wanted to host this webinar. Let me go ahead and change the slide. We wanted to host this webinar as an opportunity to raise awareness on the importance of asthma and allergies. And the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America declares May to be National Asthma and Allergy Awareness Month. It's a peak season for people with allergies and asthma and a perfect time to educate patients, families, friends, um, school staff, and many others about this. And the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America's Food Allergy Division, Kids with Food Allergies, honors Food Allergy Awareness Week and the second week of May. And so we also wanted to share a brief background on this today as well. And we wanted to highlight this week briefly before we go into our asthma and allergy segment of our webinar that will be presented today by Dr. Francis. And so a little bit about food allergies is that this is the immune response to a bad reaction to food. And Food allergies are becoming a growing uh, food safety and public health concern, which about 8% of children, according to the CDC and the US are affected by food allergies. And approximately 2% of adults also face this concern too. And so about 90% of allergic food reactions are caused by eight foods. And these include um, milk, eggs, fish, shellfish, tree nuts, peanuts, wheat, and soybeans, which you guys did see on the previous slide, the image. And so, you know, some of these reactions of food allergies can cause really serious reactions. So it's really important. Um, the FDA also works to ensure that the labels of food consumers uh, have this accurate and complete information about these eight foods. And the link to log in. We have this one on the link. allergies and asthma right now. Yeah. At this time, I just ask um, if you're not muted to go ahead and mute yourself. Thank you so much. And just a few uh, brief tips in regards to my plate that we wanted to share with you all today is in regards to the food groups that are extremely important to our diet and foods like vegetables, fruits, whole grains, low fat dairy products, and lean protein foods contain the nutrients that everybody needs. And so some of these tips include um, to make half of your plate full of fruits and vegetables. So you want to make sure that you're eating a variety of them, um, especially, you know, dark green, red and orange vegetables as options, plus beans and peas. And it's important to note that fresh, frozen and canned vegetables and fruits also count too. And to consider um, choosing low sodium, um, reduced sodium or no salt added options. And you want to make sure that at least half of your plate, um, half of your grains are whole and to vary your protein choices. And so eating a variety of foods from protein food group um, each week, such as seafood, nuts and beans, as well as lean meat, poultry and eggs. And making sure that, you know, if you do have these food allergies to make sure that you 
do substitutes and alternatives to make sure that you don't have any adverse reactions. And lastly, just a friendly reminder, um, we wanna make sure that we're participating in at least two hours and 30 minutes or more a week of physical activity that requires a moderate intensity. And some examples might be brisk walking, jogging, um, and riding a bicycle. And so now I will go ahead, give me one second, sorry. Go ahead and introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Adriana Bonacea Francis, who is a physician from the Florida Center for Allergy and Asthma Center, Allergy and Asthma Care, and has been with them since 2007. She works in the Homestead, Kendall Regional and Kendall offices. Dr. Francis was born in Argentina and went to medical school at the National University of Rosario in Argentina. She did her internship and residency in pediatrics at Snyder Children's Hospital and Tufts University in Boston, Massachusetts. She did her fellowship in allergy and immunology at Kansas City. And Dr. Francis is board eligible in pediatrics and allergy immunology. She is a member of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, as well as a member of the board of the Dave County Medical Association. Without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Francis. Thank you again for joining us today. Good afternoon, all of you. Thank you so much for having me today and giving me the opportunity of talk about uh, asthma and uh, uh, allergies in general. Um, as you know, uh, May is Asthma and Allergy Awareness Month, and we are going to talk a little bit about uh, maybe asthma. Um, first, uh, let's talk about what is asthma. So, um, can we see the next slide, please? Number three. Number three, yeah. Okay, so asthma is a chronic disease that affect your airways. Uh, your airways are um, these tubes that carry air on in and out of your lungs. Um, I'm sorry, go back to the previous one. Thank you. Um, people that have uh, the possibility of getting asthma has what is called inflammation. There is inflammation of the inside uh, liner of uh, these uh, tubes or, or bronchi, and there is inflammation of the muscle around these uh, tubes that is going to be contracted and produce difficulty for the air to come in and out of the lungs. Next slide, please. On the next slide, you can see um, a normal airway and an airway that is inflamed due to asthma. And you can see that there is no only contraction around the, the muscles, but it's also increased production of mucus that is going to produce mucus plug and difficulty for the air to come out of the airways. So mainly uh, asthma is inflammation and this inflammation can be produced uh, for different um, factors. Uh, the main factor is going to be genetics number one and then it's going to be the possibility of having allergies and also um, the interaction with the environment. Next slide please. So as I was talking before, the genetic characteristic is mainly the uh, allergy, but it's also uh, a genetic component that um, makes that in a family, there, are, there will be multiple individuals that will have uh, this condition. Um, allergy is an um, abnormal reaction of the body to the regular things that we are um, we have around, like uh, foods, like uh, dust, uh, animal dander, and all that. And this uh, response 
is given by an immunoglobulin, which is a protein that we have in the body that is usually uh, important to prevent or to uh, treat some uh, conditions like parasites, but in the case of people that have the genetic predisposition for allergies, this uh, immunoglobulin E is going to be high and it's going to produce um, allergic rhinitis, asthma, eczema, and, and um, hives or urticaria. Uh, next slide, please. So besides uh, the genetic predisposition, uh, it's important to consider the environmental exposure. Uh, we are not born with allergies. We are born with a pre genetic predisposition to become allergic. So the environment is very important. There have been multiple studies showing that people that has been um, uh, an interaction with different things in the environment um, can develop allergies over time, uh, as well as especially kids that when they are involved to an environment with that is not clean, like in farms, uh, has less predisposition to become allergic. On the other hand, the excess of cleanness that we are using nowadays is one of the reasons that we think that the allergy has been in increasing. So uh, there are many factors interacting for a person to become uh, asthmatic. Next slide, please. So, as we talk about um, allergies and we talk about inflammation, there are multiple factors that can trigger uh, what we call an asthma attack or an asthma exacerbation. These factors can be um, from the inside or can be from the outside. From the inside, sometimes can be um, the allergic reaction to uh, the environment, but there are some other factors that is they are not producing allergy, but are producing the contraction of the muscle and making uh, the asthma symptoms appear, like uh, sometimes exercise, um, cold air, low temperature, exposure to tobacco. And if a person has allergies, Many of the allergens <clears throat> when uh, this person is exposed are going to produce this reaction. So mainly dust mite, uh, insect particles, especially cockroach, cat, dog, um, molds in the environment can uh, trigger these symptoms. In children, it's much more frequent that the viral infections can be the reason why they start having problems with their breathing. Um, next one, please. So what are the symptoms of asthma and how we diagnose asthma? As we said, uh, asthma is a chronic condition. So usually we don't say that a person has asthma the first time that they have the symptoms. Uh, it has to be a repeated pattern so we can consider that this person has asthma. The most common symptoms are wheezing, um, coughing, chest tightness, and short of breath. In uh, children, one of the most common symptoms, and sometimes it's the only symptoms that we have, is coughing. And the particularity of the cough is, is usually in the early morning or at night, and it's much more frequent uh, uh, not only at this time of the day, but also triggered by uh, cold temperature and exercise. Um, so when someone goes to the doctor and say, I have been coughing uh, every night and sometimes I have this uh, wheeze, where is this wheezing sensation? And as soon as I start doing some activity, I have uh, tightness in my chest or I cannot do all the activities uh, that I usually do. Uh, we have to consider the possibility of uh, asthma. The very important number one 
to diagnose of asthma is to have a very good medical history, physical exam, and then there are some specific tests, especially pulmonary function tests to see uh, how um, the um, volumes in the lungs are at the present moment. Next, please. Okay. Um, in the past, uh, asthma was considered our one disease. Um, in the recent years, in the past 20, 30 years, there has been changing this concept. So we consider asthma like a big umbrella under which there are different kinds of uh, asthma. Uh, one is the early onset, and is the early onset is in childhood, and most of the time is triggered by a viral infection, especially in babies. RSV, the respiratory syncytial virus, is one of the, the main um, inflammatory uh, agent that can, over time, um, depending on the genetics, develop on asthma. Uh, then we have allergic asthma that is um, also very common in children and young adults, and it can start very early in life when um, patients are exposed to different allergens that are able to produce a reaction. Um, there is uh, the non-allergic asthma in, is a different kind of um, substances in the body and different kind of um, uh, white blood cells that are involved in this type of asthma. And it's usually the non-allergic asthma is developed in adults. Occupational asthma is mainly uh, the one that is produced after exposure to different chemicals, especially people that work in some areas of the industry. And then there is the exercise-induced asthma that is many times is uh, someone that uh, had asthma as a child and over time got better because of treatment, but uh, only developed symptoms of asthma during exercise. Next, please. Okay, so we were talking about uh, asthma and allergies. Um, right now, it is considered that about 25 million Americans have asthma, and 20 million of those are adults and 5 million are children. And also, if we look about food allergies, there are 32 million Americans that have history of food allergies and another 24 that have symptoms of allergic rhinitis, allergic conjunctivitis. So there is a, a correlation in between allergies and asthma, because we know that this immunoglobulin E that is um, increased in people with allergies is increased in people with asthma, and there are many uh, environmental allergens, especially pollens, uh, dust mite, cat, dogs, that can trigger these symptoms. There is um, no a good correlation in between uh, asthma and food allergies, but what is known is that the people that have asthma and food allergies has a higher risk of half um, a very severe reaction to the food once they are exposed to the food they are allergic to. So if we consider that there is a big part of uh, the population with asthma that have allergies, um, doing a good um, test to find out what kind of allergies this uh, patient have, and consider the possibility of uh, putting this uh, patients on immunotherapy, which is uh, the what is called allergy shots, uh, which is a desensitization, is use the allergen that the person is allergic to and inject slowly and increase the dose and try to decrease the sensitivity to these allergens. That usually helps a lot to relieve the asthma symptoms as long as, as the um, 
allergic rhinitis and allergic conjunctivitis. Unfortunately, we don't have anything like that for foods. There has been developed some studies with the peanut, but it's just to decrease the sensitivity, but it's not a cure for that. And as we have to be aware that also there is not a cure for asthma, but there are many treatments that can help us to control the symptoms. Next, please. So what do we do? Uh, once we have a good medical history, we have the skin test to find out what kind of allergies this patient has if they uh, have uh, allergies. And we do what is called a pulmonary function test, which is measuring the volumes of the lungs to see how much inflammation there is and how much reversibility is after giving some medications. Then we develop an asthma treatment. And usually this is uh, an, a strategy that we can do. And there are some uh, recommendations there. One is the gene study that has been given um, guidelines so we can uh, address this condition. So there are what are called controlling medications. And there are a few of them um, that has been developed over the past 50 years. The first one that we usually use are the inhaled corticosteroids. And there are different names. If you can see on the slides, it's fluticasone, floven, budesonide, mometasone, and all that. So usually we start with one medication that can be the inhaled steroid, or can be something called anti-leukotriens, like it's uh, the Montelukasos singular. And if this does not control the symptoms, we can add something else that is called long-acting bronchodilator. The short-acting bronchodilators like albuterol, ventolin, Proair, are the ones that we use when uh, a person has symptoms to relieve the symptoms immediately, but it's a short-acting, as the name say, that it will last for about six to eight hours and is only used when the person has symptoms. If the person has symptoms very frequently and we started with the uh, inhaled corticosteroids uh, and that control the symptoms, we continue with the same one. But if the symptoms are not controlled, we can add a long acting bronchodilator. And in this case, many times we give it uh, in combinations because the long acting bronchodilators cannot be used alone. They have to use to be used in combination with uh, the inhaled corticosteroids. The reason why we use inhaled corticosteroids is that we decrease the inflammation immediately uh, acting so, uh, over the bronchi and the amount of corticosteroids that is going into the blood system is much less than if we have to use the um, uh, oral uh, corticosteroids that has a lot of side effects and we don't want a person to be on that constantly. If this uh, combination doesn't work, there is another one that is, can be added that is um, called ipratropium, that is you know, um, an anticholinergic agent. And in some people, uh, none of these will work. They still will have symptoms. And now in the past 20 years, um, the biologics uh, came out. The biologics are what they are called monoclonal antibodies, that they specifically address some of the cause of uh, the allergies or the um, asthma. Like omalizumab, that is for allergic asthma and is going to address the high immunoglobulin E. The others, uh, berralizumab, mepolizumab, and reslizumab, are associated with the increase uh, of uh, eosinophils that are some of the white blood cells in the blood. And recently, dupilumab or dupixin has been added and it acts uh, on different interleukins that are the ones that can produce inflammation. Next slide, please. Okay. 
we usually what we do, uh, especially with kids, uh, and they need this at home, and they also need this at the school, is what is called an asthma action plan. And as you can see, there are uh, three different colors as uh, there is in a uh, street line, uh, light, I'm sorry, is green, yellow, and red. Uh, green means that the symptoms are controlled, that the person does not have symptoms, that not, doesn't wake up at night with coughing or difficulty breathing. And during this time when uh, there is um, the green area, uh, the, per the patient is uh, taking the control medications, either inhaled corticosteroids, either the combination of inhaled corticosteroids and um, long-acting bronchodilator or um, uh, uh, interleukin anti-leukotrienes like Montelukast. Once the patient starts with symptoms, wheezing, coughing, shorter breath, or any of these, we consider that that is the yellow zone in that is caution. And in that, at that time, usually we recommend to start with a short acting bronchodilator like albuterol or Proair and can be taken every four to six, four, six or eight hours, depending how bad are the symptoms. But if the patient uh, continue using the albuterol every four hours and the symptoms are not resolving and start having more difficulty breathing, we consider in that time that is going to be the red zone and that's the time to call um, the physician or call the emergency room or call 911. And um, most of the time, when a person entering the red zone has to be added some other medication and the most uh, common medication that will be added at that time is going to be oral corticosteroids. Next, please. Okay, uh, during this past uh, year and a half, uh, there was uh, a new uh, virus that has been giving us a hard time because at the very beginning, we didn't know exactly how it was going to be uh, acting on patients with allergies. In general, um, as uh, the COVID-19 is a virus that is uh, um, affecting the respiratory symptoms, uh, patients with asthma are going to have um, at the risk to be hospitalized and, and to need um, um, sometimes um, respiratory assistance. Uh, in general, uh, though, because many of these patients are already on inhaled corticosteroids and inhaled corticosteroids can help with the decrease of uh, inflammation in COVID-19, um, sometimes this can be very helpful. But as we know, it is important that patients with asthma, if they have um, infection with COVID, to be immediately referred to either emergency room or to the primary care physician to start treatment as soon as possible and to check especially the um, oxygen saturation in the blood to decide when it's time to be admitted to a hospital and which is the best medication at that time and still have you know all the recommendations that we have to uh, protect from the infection which is you know wear a mask uh, distance uh, uh, hand washing with soap and water and at this time of course the main recommendation is to get the vaccine as soon as possible to have a better protection and next please Okay, there are some um, myths or misconceptions about asthma. Uh, number one, um, asthma is a childhood disease and will outgrow at, uh, when they age. That is not true. Yes, asthma is more frequent in children. Yes, asthma can be um, treated and symptoms can disappear over time but there is something that is very important to know that is 
there is no cure for asthma. You still, over time, will have this sensitivity in the bronchi that is going to produce um, inflammation and over time infections or allergies can trigger the symptoms um, during adulthood. And no, asthma is not an infection uh, disease, but yes, infections are usually uh, a trigger for asthma symptoms. And as I said, in young, young kids, especially in babies and toddlers, the respiratory syncytial virus can be the trigger that then um, uh, develop asthma over time. Uh, as, uh, exercise is one of uh, the big things because many times, especially in children, the mother come and say, oh, he's having shorter of breath with exercise. I don't want my son or my daughter to exercise, which is uh, the opposite. If uh, the asthma is well controlled or if there is a plan, especially to take medication before exercise, uh, anyone can do exercise and that will benefit because it will open up the airways and especially in children develop the lungs in a better way. The other thing is, as I said before, that we use um, high dose of corticosteroids only in uh, patients that are very difficult to control or they have severe asthma. But now in the past 20, 30 years, we have these new medications that are not steroids that can control the symptoms and avoid the use of high dose of corticosteroids. Okay, I think this uh, ends my presentation. And if you have any questions, I will be glad to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Francis, for that insightful presentation. And also, we'll go ahead and begin the Q&A. And we did receive some questions before when everybody did register. We have received a few questions in the chat. Um, so I'll go ahead and share those first. And I think you may have just answered it, but maybe to share a little more. Are corticoid steroids used in pediatrics for ill-controlled asthma symptoms? Um, yes, we, we use the uh, corticosteroids in children. Uh, and as I said, um, just to compare, when a child has an asthma exacerbation, it has to be on five days or on oral prednisone. The amount of prednisone that is going to be in his or her system is equivalent to one year or inhaled corticosteroids. So even though uh, we are given steroids, the amount that we are given because it's going directly into the bronchi is much less than if, ha if you have to use oral steroids. That answer your question? Thank you so much for sharing that. And the next question we have in the chat, it says, if an individual does not act, outgrow asthma, can, they, can that mean that they were probably misdiagnosed if into adulthood the individual has no more symptoms of asthma? Well, um, as I said, Asthma is a chronic disease. Uh, asthma cannot be cured, but can be controlled with medications. Uh, asthma is much more common during childhood. And yes, over time, if uh, the, uh, the patient is well controlled, may not have symptoms except at some point like with exercise, or when exposed to some of the allergens that can trigger that. Um, yes, there are many, many people that over time have the asthma so well controlled and there is no inflammation that after um, uh, puberty, after um, adolescence, they can have no symptoms at all. And at that time we say, well, doesn't have asthma symptoms, we don't know if they will develop at some point with a viral infection or with cold temperature or with exercise. Thank you so much. 
The next question we have that we received was, what are some of the different ways allergies affect people, particularly when the spring season begins? And then there's a second part to that. How important is it to have spring cleaning to avoid a breakout of allergies, especially if you are allergic to pollen and dust? Okay. When we, um, of course, uh, spring is usually a hard time for people with uh, allergies. Here in Miami, we don't have those definite seasons. So sometimes um, we have more symptoms related to uh, infections and that could be during the fall and winter. But still during the spring, we have some, um, there is something that, uh, sometimes is is no well known. The dust mites they overgrow. The temperature is about seventy, and the humidity is about seventy percent. So here in Miami, most part of the year we have that, but especially during the spring we have those temperature and that humidity. So dust might grow more than some other times. And the same with the pollen. A uh, recommendation for people that have allergies to dust mite, we have a whole instruction of how your bedroom should be. Because remember, during the day, you are in and out the house, in and out different places. But at, now you, at night, you spend seven, eight hours in the same environment. So it's very important uh, not to uh, use a broom, use to a vacuum cleaner, even if you mm -hmm. have uh, you know, any kind of, of floor. Do not have a carpet in your bedroom. Try to have the less amount of stuff that can collect dust, especially in children. Do not have too many stuffed animals that can collect dust and can trigger that. Uh, there, there, with the allergy, with the pollen season, Number one, the pollen uh, count peaks in between four and 10 in the morning. So usually an individual that has allergies and is going to do any kind of outside activity have to try to do it close to uh, noontime and in the afternoon or in the evening because the pollen count is going to be less. And the same thing, uh, windy days, windy days, uh, we know that the pollen travels uh, uh, at that time, and um, that's the time that they can have more symptoms. Cleaning, um, yes, of course, we recommend the cleaning, but it has to be some precautions. If someone has allergies, <clears throat> that's why they should be wearing the mask and doing the cleaning. And uh, many times use the uh, um, inhale uh, short acting bronchodilator before doing the cleaning to prevent the symptoms. Thank you for sharing that. And that leads us into our next question. At what age can or should asthma be diagnosed? Well, there is no age. What, what, uh, there are two things that has to be considered. Number one, I said that some uh, babies or toddlers, they can have this infection, that is RSV, and that uh, is causing bronchiolitis, and the bronchiolitis is the first uh, inflammatory process. And in order to say that this child or this uh, baby has asthma, has to be a few asthma exacerbations, because have to be chronic. If uh, the first time that someone is wheezing, we don't diagnose asthma. We said that there is inflammation, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, but not asthma. So asthma has to be chronic. Remember that it has to be at least two or three episodes in a, in a few months to say that this uh, patient has asthma. Thank you. And so this leads to our next question. I think you already covered um, the various symptoms of allergies. So we'll go to the next one. Could you please share some best practices um, for inhaler use? Oh, yes. <laughs> That's the big, big issue because let me tell you, even when we teach uh, patients with asthma, 
we also review the technique every time they are coming because people forget how to use it or get used to just do something to control and not do it properly. So I have here, I don't know if you can see it, that is the most common device that we use. This is what is uh, the Ventolin or Proel or short acting bronchodilator. So number one, <clears throat> every time that you're going to use this device, you have to shake it. One, two, three, four, five. Then you take a deep breath in and out because you want to take out as much possible the air that you have in your bronchi so you can make a space for the inhaler that you're going to use. Okay, so deep breath in and out. You put this in your mouth and when you click, you take a deep breath in and hold it for 10 seconds. Then you blow out, wait 30 seconds and do it again. That uh, is the most common one used. There are some others that are much easier sometimes because these require a little bit of coordination when you press and you take a deep breath. The new ones is that you open and you suck it in very hard, but the key here is always to hold it for 10 seconds. If you don't hold it for 10 seconds, it will get stuck in your throat and it's not going to be deep enough to affect the bronchi. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I do wanna share, we have gotten a few comments um, sharing that in Florida, we have year round pollen, tree, grass, and ragweed. Yes. And another question um, related to this is could an individual develop new allergen responses that can trigger asthma as an adult? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Uh, can what? Say it again. Um, the question is, could an individual develop new allergen response that can trigger asthma as an adult? Yes. Um, as I said, we are not born with allergies we are born with a predisposition to become allergic and over the years we can become allergic to different stuff maybe as a child the more frequent one is indoor environment uh, in environmental allergens like dust mites animal down there but over time with exposure uh, you can develop allergies to any pollens at any time in your life Okay, thank you so much for that. We have a few more questions and then we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. And so um, now we'll go into a little bit of the, the food allergy questions that we received. Um, is there any correlation to asthma and food allergies that you wanted to share a little more about? Well, as I said before, uh, there have been many studies done to see if um, food can trigger an asthma uh, attack. And in general, what it has been shown is that there is a correlation that people that have food allergies and have asthma, that when they develop an uh, allergic reaction to the food, it's going to be much more severe because at that time they are going also to have, uh, you know, uh, a spas of uh, the bronchi but it has not been shown that there is a direct correlation in between um, food triggering the asthma attack. Okay. And then the next one that they've asked is, how can someone overcome food allergies uh, such as seafood? Well, food allergy is, uh, is very, very tricky because sometimes you can react, sometimes you don't react, sometimes you have a big reaction, sometimes you have a mild reaction. Some people can tolerate the small amounts of uh, the food they are allergic to, some people don't tolerate the small amount. What happens is, in general, um, allergy to cow's milk, to um, eggs, to wheat, corn, they disappear over time. Usually it's very common in children and over a period of one, two or three years, they disappear. Peanut, tree nut, shellfish and fish are not the same. For some reason, 
it's much more difficult to uh, overcome this kind of, uh, of allergies. Um, it has been shown like, uh, let's say with penicillin at the beginning, a few years ago, we were thinking that once you were allergic to penicillin, you are going to be allergic all your life. And it has been shown that if you are not exposed to penicillin, you develop, you decrease 10% per year of your sensitivity. So it's the same thing with foods. Uh, we don't know how long will it take, but maybe over the years, someone that is not that allergic, let's say to shellfish, they can stop having a reaction. But it's difficult to know because it's one of those food allergies that tend to be uh, kind of permanent. Right. And on that topic, um, we also have received, what is the likelihood to outgrow anaphylaxis uh, milk allergy? And if there are multiple food allergies, um, does this decrease the chance? Of uh, decreasing anaphylactic reaction to food? Well, uh, on food, the only treatment that we have is avoidance. Uh, so the more you avoid a food, the less possibility you have to have a reaction. But also it's very individualized. As I said, some people can tolerate a small amount, some people can tolerate a small amount, um, let's say of a cooked egg in, in a cake, and some people are so sensitive that can react to that. Uh, but the only the only way to overcome food allergies is complete avoidance. Thank you for sharing that and that reminder to everybody. And so I'm just seeing one more question in the chat, and that is, um, can you also provide some tips for nebulizers uh, for pediatric patients? Okay. Um, uh, nebulizer machines are very good for children because they don't need to take a deep breath in, they don't need to do any kind of uh, a specific movement to get the medication in. So usually the nebulizer treatments are recommended to both, um, you know, tips of the spectrum, either for young kids or for older people that are not able to coordinate the inhaler as I showed you before. Um, the principle is the same as the one that I show you and is um, uh, more effective in children because of that, because they don't need the coordination, they don't need to do anything. The only thing is, uh, you know, has to be used on, only when it's really needed. Um, you don't have to wait until a child cannot breathe to use it. If you know how the child is going to react to different things, once they start with a cough or a little bit of uh, difficulty breathing, you can start with a nebulizer treatment and it's usually every four, six or eight hours depending on the symptoms. Thank you for sharing that. So at this time, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. If there's anything else that anybody wants to share, uh, please go ahead and take a moment to share that in the chat box. And also, Dr. Francis, thank you for taking the time to answer all of our uh, guests their questions. We greatly appreciate it. And at this time, also, um, again, as a reminder, today's event, is part of the Florida Department of Health here in Miami-Dade County, the Office of Community Health and Planning webinar series, Healthy Happens Here. And also please stay tuned for some upcoming events that we will be having in June. And we will be sending out more details of that. And finally, please make sure to visit healthymiamidade.org, which you can see here on the screen with our social media handles to receive the latest updates from the Consortium for a Healthier Miami-Dade, as well as other health educational um, information. We'll also have this recording shared under our Healthy Happens Here series tab on the website so that you guys can go back and refer to or that you wanna share with other 
community partners. And we'll also be sharing uh, the evaluation link for today's webinar, just to have you take a few moments to complete as we use your feedback for future ideas and future development. So thank you again for joining us today. We greatly appreciate your time. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Candice, I just have one question. Uh, is, can you share the information of the presenter? We'd love to um, partner with her to have her you know, speak to our um, population for the Head Start and Early Head Start program parents. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Francis, is it OK if um, we share some contact information. Is there something that you would yes. like to share with us that we yes, can send you can, out? Uh, you can check with uh, Francesca and she will give you all the information that you need and yes. Okay, awesome, perfect. Okay. Well, thank you again, everybody. I thank hope you have a great day and thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much. Have a good day.